Okay, let's go on where we stopped last time. I'm now discussing various coordinate systems for the Schwarzschild space-time. And in addition to the traditional Schwarzschild coordinates, the first one I already began with last time was the so-called isotropic coordinates. Let me briefly remind you what this was. Because I want to add a few remarks which I forgot last time. <laughs> So the isotropic coordinates, this was a transformation of the radius coordinate alone. So the t, the theta, and the phi remain unchanged. And we introduced a new radial coordinate. This was 1 half root r squared minus rsr plus r minus rs half. And this can be easily solved for r. So it's a 1 1 transformation of the coordinate r into a new coordinate r tilde. And then the metric had the following form r tilde minus rs fourth squared, r tilde plus rs over 4 squared, c squared dt squared. And now comes the interesting part there's a factor in front of everything. r tilde plus rs over 4 to the 4 divided by r tilde to the 4. And now comes the standard Euclidean uh, metric in um, spherical coordinates, in spherical polar coordinates. That's it. And you see, the interesting thing is that the spatial part is a conformal factor times the flat metric. And this means because a conformal factor doesn't change angles. So if you measure angles with this metric, or if you measure angles with this metric, you get the same angles. So you get different lengths, of course, but you get the same angles. If you think of the cosine rules, you have lengths in the numerator, lengths in the denominators, and this factor drops out. So you can measure length in these coordinates uh, immediately. So let's uh, remind ourselves by what property the usual Schwarzschild coordinates were characterized. In the Schwarzschild coordinates, if you have a circle, an R line, say uh, yeah, a particle in circular motion around our Schwarzschild center, then the circumference of this circle was 2 pi r, where r is the Schwarzschild coordinates. But angles in this picture with ordinary Schwarzschild coordinates have absolutely no uh, geometric meaning. So if you consider, for instance, this is the orbit of a planet, say, and here we have a light ray which passes through, and you measure this angle. You just read it from the picture in the coordinates, in Schwarzschild coordinates. This has nothing to do with the angle which is actually measured in space. But that's different in these coordinates. In these coordinates, the angle this is, of course, different from 2 pi r tilde. You can read it from this expression, right? So the circumference is, has nothing to do with the r tilde co uh, coordinate, but the angle has something to do with the r tilde coordinate. So if you use the isotropic coordinates, you can read angles from the picture. And if you use the ordinary Schwarzschild coordinates, you can read the circumference of circles from the picture. So what you are more interested in decides which coordinates you are using. So these isotropic coordinates are very useful for, for many respects. Uh, for instance, if you do gravitational lensing in the Schwarzschild space-time, you very often use these isotropic coordinates. Uh, and actually, you can introduce isotropic coordinates for any spherically symmetric and static space-time. So those of you who have already heard about Reisner Nordström space-time, for instance, or, or Taubnat space-time, or something like that, for all these coordinates, for all these space-times, you can introduce coordinates where the spatial part is just a conformal factor times a flat metric. So and, uh, you often do this for spherically symmetric and static mat uh, ma um, metrics. For an arbitrary space-time, this is in general not possible. Yeah, the spatial part will not be conformal to, to a flat metric. But in for spherically symmetric and static space-times, this is always the case. And what I forgot last time to say is what happens with the, with the surface r equal rs. You remember our, in our old Schwarzschild coordinates, the metric became singular at r equal rs. The metric coefficients became singular. And uh, what the isotropic coordinate does is it just shifts the singularity. And let's see what is, if r is equal rs, 
what is an R tilde. You can read it from this equation here. So if R is equal to Rs, then the square root gives zero, right? So we have one half, then a zero, plus Rs minus Rs half. And this is Rs over four, if I'm not very much mistaken, right? This is Rs over two, and another two, so this is Rs over four. And now let's look at the metric, what happens at Rs over four. We have no zero in the denominator, because here we have a plus. But we have a zero in the numerator, and this is almost as bad, because if the GTT becomes zero, this means that the metric becomes degenerate. Yeah, it's a diagonal metric. If one of the diagonal elements becomes zero, then of course the determinant of the thing is zero. And if the determinant is zero, then the inverse doesn't exist. So the metric itself, the metric coefficients, they stay finite, but the inverse doesn't exist. And this is equally bad. So we have the same kind of coordinate singularity also in the isotropic coordinates. So it just shifts this, uh, this surface to another value from r equal rs to r equal uh, to r tilde equal rs over 4. But you have the same kind of singularity there. So it doesn't help you resolving this problem. Let's try another coordinate system which uh, actually will also not help us with a, uh, with a singularity, but which will give us some other in, uh, interesting information. This is the so-called Turtis coordinate. This is not named after a gentleman by this name, but rather it's the English word for, for Schildkröte, right? So these are the Schildkröten coordinaten in German. In German. And uh, I will explain in a minute where this funny name comes from. So you introduce, it's again a transformation where you transform just the R coordinate. So in the beginning you have R, T, theta, and phi, and you transform only the R. So now you get something which I denote R hat. In the literature it's very often denoted R star, but I use R star for the radius of my central object. So I think I should not use R star because it should uh, uh, cause confusion. And uh, now I should find the right page in my notes. It's not so. Uh, where am I here? Oops. Here we are. So this new coordinate is R. It is plus, right? Yes, plus Rs. And then the log R over Rs minus 1. So this is an equation which cannot be solved for R in terms of elementary function. Yeah, that's what one calls a transcendental function. You have here the r, and then you have the r under the log function. You cannot solve this for r. But there is a unique inverse function. It cannot be expressed in terms of elementary function. So you get, there, is a, uh, there is a unique inverse function. And actually, this is a one-to-one -one transformation of the radius coordinate. And you see immediately what happens to r equal rs. R equal Rs is shifted. Well, if R is equal to Rs, then I have a zero here. What is the log of zero? Minus infinity. So this transformation shifts the surface R equal Rs to minus infinity. Yeah, so if in your old coordinates, here was the R axis, here is R equal zero, and here somewhere is Rs, then our space time was nicely behaved in this domain. And now we have these new coordinates, our hat. Here is 0, and now it is the whole axis. Yeah, so r equal rs is shifted to minus infinity. And that's the reason why John Wheeler calls this the Turtis coordinate. It, uh, this name, of course, alludes to the famous paradox of Zeno. Zeno's paradox on the race of the ancient hero Achilles against the Turtles. I think you all know this. How does this run, this paradox? Achilles, who was the fastest runner in, uh, in ancient times, a, uh, um, uh, starts a, a foot race uh, against the turtles. And because Achilles is a fair person, he gives the turtles a head start. 
Okay? So here's a, here's a start line, and then the tortoise starts, and uh, so here's a tortoise. Oops, we have it here, tortoise. And here's Achilles. And uh, Achilles waits until the tortoise is here, and then he starts. So then he starts, he's a fast runner, so he's very soon at this point, but when he reaches this point, the tortoise is already here. And then Achilles follows, and Achilles is here, the tortoise is already here. And when Achilles reaches this point, the tortoise is here. And now Zeno argues, whenever Achilles is at the point where the tortoise was one step, bef one step before, the tortoise is ahead, so he will never reach the tortoise. That's what one calls a paradox. Actually, it's not a paradox, it's just an error. <laughs> yeah, it's a logical error, and where is a logical error? There's an implicit conclusion which is simply wrong. So what, I, what, what Zeno does is he gives a prescription how to divide a certain interval into infinitely many steps. And then he concludes that then this interval must be infinite. Yeah? But this is, of course, false. Yeah? We know about converging series. And this is an example for a converging series. It's a geometric series. And you can easily calculate the time at which Achilles actually reaches the tortoise. Yeah, it's given by this construction, it's given as an infinite series, but the series converges towards a finite number. It depends on the ratio of the speeds of the two, uh, of the two things. So, and uh, when uh, John Wheeler introduced this coordinate, he, uh, he uh, remembered himself of this, uh, of this uh, old ancient story. And uh, the idea is, of course, that just as Achilles, according to this argument, never reaches the tortoise, in just the same way this coordinate, our head, never reaches r equal rs. Yeah, because it is shifted to minus infinity. And that's why it's called the tortoise coordinate. And it's very useful for many aspects. Uh, one important thing where you always use the tortoise coordinate is if you solve wave equations on the Schwarzschild spacetime. There's a famous Reggio Wheeler equation which uh, describes waves on, uh, on a Schwarzschild spacetime. And this is usually written in terms of, these, of this tortoise coordinate because uh, then the equations become particularly um, convenient. And uh, it's also used for other things. We will encounter it in a minute again. It will implicitly occur also in the eddington finkelstein coordinates. With the eddington finkelstein coordinates, which we do in a minute, they, uh, they are closely related to this, to this tortoise coordinates. So uh, uh, I just wanted to mention this because it's important for, for many applications and you should have heard about it uh, once. And, um, but I will then move. Uh, again, uh, of course, it doesn't help us uh, understand what's going on at r equal rs because if you shift r equal rs to minus infinity, then it's out of the game, right? Then you cannot learn anything about possible extensions of the space time beyond r equal rs. So for this purpose, these are the worst coordinates you can choose, yeah? Because then it's obviously impossible to extend the space time in this coordinate system across uh, the surface r equal rs. And when I, when I spoke about wave equations, then of course uh, you can only consider the waves uh, outside of r equal rs in these coordinates. Yeah? But that's what you are usually uh, only interested in. If you are an observer outside, then uh, as we will discuss in a minute, you cannot receive signals from inside. So um, uh, uh, the waves you can actually, you can actually receive, they are, they are confined to the region outside of r equal rs. Okay, this was the tortoise coordinate, just a quick mention. And now I come to the Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, and these are the most interesting ones and the most important ones for understanding what a Schwarzschild black hole is. And I guess most of you, if not all of you, have seen them before, but they are so important that I will spend some time again discussing them. So, and they are actually the coordinates which will give us a possibility to go across the surface r equal rs. They will allow us to extend the space time um, across this surface. And in this time, in these two cases, we have just transformed the r coordinate, r into a new r coordinate. The other ones remain unchanged. Now we introduce a new t coordinate. And we introduce it in a way that depends on both t and r. Yeah, the old t and the old r. 
So it's in this sense more complicated than the other coordinates. So this is a coordinate transformation of the form So our old coordinates were t, r, theta, and phi. And now we introduce a new coordinate. I call it t prime. Actually, there are two, there are two types, the so-called ingoing and the outgoing adding Finkelstein coordinates. One I denote t prime, the other one I denote t double prime. And r, theta, and phi are the old ones. But the t depends, the new t, that's the t prime, depends on t and r. So it's not just the transformation of the time into itself. It's a mixture of the old time and the old radius coordinate. And the idea is that we map ingoing or outgoing light rays onto straight lines. Yeah, we make a coordinate transformation that either the ingoing or the outgoing radial light rays are mapped onto straight lines. In order to do this, we have to calculate the ingoing and outgoing uh, light rays. So that's the first thing I have to do. So the metric was, uh, or, or let me write, uh, consider radial light rays. Yeah, light rays which stay on a radial line. So theta and phi are constant. So what does this mean? A radial light ray, that's a curve. It's a light ray, so it must have g mu nu dx mu ds dx nu ds is zero. This means it is light-like, right? S is a parameter along our light-like geodesic. We cannot use uh, proper time. Yeah, along light rays, proper time uh, is not a meaningful concept. We choose what is called an affine parameter, and we call it S. And then it should be radial. This means that the theta by ds and the phi by ds should be zero. Oops. So we can evaluate this equation. So we have the metric. I do this in the, in the old coordinates, in the good old Schwarzschild coordinates. So I just write out this here. So we have. Zero is GTT, dt by ds squared. Then we have GRR, dr by ds squared. And then the rest is zero, because we consider a radial light, uh, light ray. So what was GTT? If you remember the Schwarzschild metric, this was 1 minus Rs over Rc squared. And what was GRR? This was 1 over 1 minus Rs over R plus 1 over 1 minus Rs over R, uh, sorry, dr by ds squared. So we have, we, have, we have used two things. We have assumed that the curve is light-like, and we have assumed that it is radial. We have not assumed that it is geodesic. Yeah? There's nothing, nothing written which corresponds to the geodesic equation. But I claim that this curve must be a geodesic automatically. And this follows from the symmetry. Yeah? The geodesic equation is a second order differential equation. So for every initial point and initial vector, there's a unique solution. Now let's assume the initial vector is light-like and it points in the radial direction. And we are in a space-time which is spherically symmetric. So everything must be rotationally symmetric about the radial line along which my light ray points. And now what should the geodesic do? In, this, in the space-time which has this symmetry, if it starts in a radial direction, it must stay on, a, on this radial line. Because if it would deviate in this direction, then you would ask, why not in this? Because you have spherical symmetry. Yeah? So the only way to respect spherical symmetry is that the geodesic stays on the radial line. And this argument shows that this curve automatically must be a geodesic. If you don't believe it, check it. Yeah? If you choose the parameter appropriately, if you choose it as an affine parameter, you will find that these equations imply that you have a geodesic. Just write down all components of the geodesic equation and check that they are satisfied. You can do this. And you will find that it is true. 
So we are really talking about light rays, yeah? freely falling photons, not about uh, objects which move at the speed of light but which are accelerated in a certain way, yeah? which deviate from the, uh, from, the, from the free path. Okay, and from this last expression we can now, uh, we can now calculate the relation between T and R. So I just uh, write this in the following way. So I take this to the other side and I, and I have dt by ds squared and I divide by this here and I have 1 over dr by ds squared. So I write this in this way and on the other side I have this two times in the denominator, right? 1 minus rs over r squared. There's a c squared somewhere missing, I think, here. And what we have here is just the chain rule, right? So we can do this. That's uh, the chain rule in this uh, yeah, differential calculus. And we get, if we take the square root and solve everything for dt, and we get dt, but we have to be careful. We have to take a square root, and this means we have a plus or a minus here. Oh, let me write the plus minus on the other side. So this is plus minus uh, dr over c, 1 minus rs over r. Okay? So that's the relation between t and r along a radial light, uh, light ray. And this is an integral which I believe even I can calculate. Let me try. So, uh, that's awful. Uh, Okay, so I write integral signs in front of everything. So I get this is plus minus integral dr over c1 minus rs over r. So that's an indefinite integral, so it will involve an integration constant. And uh, yeah, of course you can look it up, but uh, it's so easy that with a little trick you can even calculate it directly. And the trick it is that I add an one or when minus rs over r plus rs over r in the numerator. C1 minus rs over r. And then you see from these two terms I get a 1. So the first integral is very easily calculated. Uh, 1 over c. And the second one is integral. So I multiply numerator and denominator with r and then I guess c r minus r s. Okay? That's something. So if I integrate this, I get of course t. And on the other side I get, uh, maybe I put the plus minus on this side back. <laughs> I think that's more reasonable. Uh, and maybe also the c. Let me write it in this way. And then I have integral over dr. Integral over dr is r. And this 1 over r minus a constant, this is a log. Yeah? So I have plus rs. And then I have the log of r minus rs. So that's, and I have an integration constant. And because here I have c times t, uh, okay, uh, let's call it, let's call it c, capital C, integration constant. So uh, it would be convenient uh, because uh, on the left hand side I have the speed of light times the time to write the constant c in a particular way. I want to write it as something plus c times t naught, then t naught is my new integration constant. And the something I introduce in such a way that here I get under the log something dimensionless. Yeah? Under the log now I have a length, something with a dimension of a length. That's usually not good because you want to have something without a dimension under the log. So let me write C in the form ln R. I need, don't need uh, uh, the modulus sign because Rs of course is positive plus T plus C T naught. 
And then I have my final formula for the ingoing and outgoing light rays. So this is R plus Rs, and now I combine this term with this term here. And then I have under the log uh, R over Rs minus 1. Okay? And the integration constant C T naught. So that's the equation for ingoing and outgoing radial light rays. Which ones are the ingoings? Which, are, which ones are the outgoing ones? So if R is increasing, then with the upper sign, T is also increasing. So these are the, wait a minute, is this correct? Uh, these are the outgoing ones, right? The, with the plus sign, they are the outgoing ones. So plus, I have outgoing, and minus, I have ingoing radial light rays. And here you recognize, it's still on the board, the Toyota's coordinate. Yeah? So this can be written as, uh, how did they call it, R hat. Yeah, this is just R hat. So you see R hat occurs in this equation for the radial light rays. So the, if you want to write it in the form dt by dr is constant. Yeah, if you want to write the, the equation for radial light rays in the form dt by dr is constant then the R coordinate you have to use is a Toyota's coordinate. Yeah? But that's not what we want to do uh, for this, uh, in this section. Now we want, to do the, we want to transform the T coordinate, not the R coordinate. And we want to transform it in a way that these light, one family of light rays, we cannot do it for both simultaneously in this way, that one of these two families becomes straight lines in the new coordinates. So let's plot the co uh, this situation first. So if we have here our r-axis and here our t-axis, let's plot ct. That's usually more convenient. Then we have somewhere our rs. Here's rs. Oops. And now let's plot these curves. These are two families of curves. The family, there are two families because I have plus and minus. And it's a family because I have this parameter T naught. So I can start where I like. Yeah? So I have a whole family of curves which uh, are related to each other just by parallel transport in the picture. Yeah, they are pushed up or down by choosing this T naught appropriately. How do they behave? If I'm very far to the right at a very big radius, then obviously, uh, wait a minute, what is here? Uh, is this the, the right order? Uh, Uh, da, 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 so what I, what I wanted to deduce is that this goes to something which goes up under 45 degrees and then diverges if the surface R equal RS is approached. Well, the, the second thing is, uh, is, uh, we, uh, is obvious, right? Because if R goes to RS, then I have, um, then, I, then this goes to minus infinity. So, uh, T with a plus sign goes to minus infinity, so these are the outgoing light rays. So this would be a typical outgoing light ray. And for the minus sign, it is just uh, the mirror image. So then I have this here. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if I, if I have these two things in the wrong order. Let me check. Oh, I have it the same way here. Ah, we, ah, it's true, it's true, everything is fine. Well, the log function um, diverges to infinity, but it increases slower than the R term. So for big R, this is dominating. That's what I wanted to, <laughs> to argue. Yeah? For big R, this is dominating. Both terms go to infinity, 
but the log uh, diverges uh, in a weaker way than any potential, than any, than any power of R. Yeah? Uh, so this term is dominating for big R. So for big R, I have this, and this is a straight line under 45 degrees. That's what I wanted to, to demonstrate. It's fine. So that's how it works uh, for, uh, here outside. And of course, a light cone. Let me draw a few other ones, at least two other ones. So then we have the light cones here. Yeah? So the so we have calculated the equation for ingoing and outgoing light rays. There are always two. This is for the minus sign, this is for the plus sign. Yeah? And uh, this can be done in every point. So depending on where we choose our T naught, we get the ingoing and outgoing light rays through any of these points outside. And these rays, yeah, they diverge if uh, R equal RS is approached. This does not necessarily mean that uh, yeah, something particularly bad happens at R equal RS. It just tells that in these coordinates, in these coordinates, the light rays do not reach R equal RS. But this is just a coordinate. And we will see in a minute that if you introduce another coordinate, then with respect to this new time coordinate, they will go through R equal RS at a finite time. And uh, we can also uh, construct these light rays uh, in the inner region. The coordinate system breaks down at R equal RS, but it is well behaved again for radius values between 0 and RS. And here we get something of this sort. Again, we have this divergence, and then it goes towards, um, towards R equal R naught at a, under a certain angle. And in this case, we read from the metric in the inner region, in the region where R is smaller than Rs, the T coordinate is space like. Yeah? If you remember the GTT, do we have it on the board still? Yes, the GTT. GTT was this here. Yeah? And you see, if R is bigger than Rs, then this is negative. So d by dt is a time like coordinate. But if R is smaller than Rs, then this is bigger than zero. This means in the inner region, T is a, a space-like coordinate. And correspondingly, R become, becomes a time-like coordinate. And this means the light cone is situated in this way. So in the outer region, if you move uh, at a speed smaller than the speed of light, you have to go up in time. You cannot stand still at constant time. In the inner region, you have to go in the direction of decreasing R. You cannot stand still at a particular R coordinate. And, uh, but these, at the moment, these are two isolated things. They are disconnected. Yeah? And um, yeah, we might say these are two separate space-times. At the moment, they are not linked together. And the question is, can we link them together? Can we introduce a coordinate system which actually glues these two things smoothly together at R equal RS? And the idea how we do this is we pull these things down with a coordinate transformation so that these light rays become straight lines. And we pull these things correspondingly down so that the two straight lines smoothly meet at R equal RS. That's the idea behind the coordinate transformation. And we can read the coordinate transformation from this expression. Where is it here? From this expression. We now have to decide if we do it with the ingoing or with the outgoing coordinate. Oh, by the way, I made a mistake. I said that in the inner region, we uh, can move only in the direction of decreasing r. That's not true. You have to decide which is the future and which is the past in the inner region. At the moment, there is no, yeah, uh, no uh, you, uh, unambiguous prescription for what is future and what is past. So you, it's clear that you cannot stand still at a particular r. But if you interpret this as a future cone, then you can move only in the direction of decreasing r. But if you interpret this as a past cone, then you can move only in the direction of increasing r. That's the difference between a black hole and a white hole, which we will discuss in a minute. So from these coordinate expressions, which we have at the moment, we cannot decide uh, what, uh, uh, how the, the time orientation is inside the region. So what is future and what is past. But if you have glued these things together in a particular way, then this decision has been made. Yeah? So we can do it either in the way that we get a black hole or in the way that we get a white hole. And if we do it with the ingoing Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates with a minus sign here, then we get a black hole. And that's what we do now. So we introduce a new t-coordinate. 
introduce ingoing Eddington Finkelstein coordinate. And this is done in the way that with a minus sign here, this term is combined with this here. So uh, this is t prime is t. This comes with a minus sign. So if I take this to the other side, it comes with the same sign. So I have a plus here, rs over c, ln r over rs minus 1. So then our equation for ingoing light rays and for outgoing light rays is transformed. One becomes nice, the other, ones becomes, the other one becomes more ugly than it was before. So then the ingoing light rays oops, are mapped onto what? This was the equation with a minus sign. Then I have, if I replace t by t prime with the help of this equation, I get here a minus c t prime. And on the other side I get r plus c t naught. Okay? And that's an equation for a straight line. Yeah, in the r t prime diagram. That's an equation for a straight line under 45 degrees if you use uh, c t prime as a vertical coordinate. And for outgoing light rays, then I have to use a plus sign here. And if I take this to the other side, if I use, uh, well, if I replace the t prime, then I get this with a factor 2 here, right? So I have c t prime is r plus 2 times the log function r over rs minus 1 plus c t naught. So this diverge is now even stronger when r equal rs is approached, right? But the other one, there's no, no pathological behavior whatsoever. So if we draw, draw now this famous Eddington Finkelstein diagram, r, it's still our good old r coordinate, the area coordinate, which we use traditionally for the Schwarzschild metric, but now we use Eddington Finkelstein time, ingoing Eddington Finkelstein time, and you have here rs, and you see the ingoing ones are just mapped onto straight lines under 45 degrees. So I go in this way. And the outgoing ones, they are now even stronger curved. Yeah, they still diverge if the surface r equal rs is approached, and oops, they behave like it's Hoxha. And the light cone is here. And now just by continuation we see that the light cone must be here and it must be here. And now we have one space-time which just mathematically extends from r equal infinity down to r equal zero. At r equal zero we have a true curvature singularity. I've already mentioned that one of the scalar invariants, the so-called Kretschmann scalar, diverges at r equal zero. And this means there's no chance to extend the space-time beyond r equals zero into the range of negative r coordinates. This won't work. Here, there's really a, here is really a singularity. Yeah? It's often indicated in this way. Here's really, um, yeah, uh, the, the curvature becomes infinite, so there's no chance of, uh, of uh, finding coordinates which can be extended beyond r equals zero. But here, at r equal rs, now everything is nice. Everything is smooth and differentiable and even analytic. And uh, yeah, how is this purely mathematical construction to be interpreted? Well, it's to be interpreted in the following way. If I have a body which, whose physical radius is smaller than Rs, then we have the vacuum space-time to the right of my, of my arm. Yeah? So everything to the right of my arm is now the vacuum space-time. And then we have this surface, R equal Rs, displayed. It's outside of the body. It's really there in the domain of the, of the validity of the metric. And we see, we can read from this picture 
that the meaning of this surface is that it is a horizon. How can we read this from this picture? So I've indicated here the light cones. The light cones tell in which direction material bodies and signals can move. Here signals can move outward or inward. Here at the horizon signals can move only inward. There's one particular light signal which can stay at R equal RS, but all the other ones go inwards. And if we are beyond R equal RS, then everything, every signal go inward. So if an observer is somewhere here, if an observer is somewhere here, it's impossible to re for this observer to receive signals from beyond R equal RS, because all signals stay to the left of this, of this surface. So we read from this picture that RS, R equal RS, is an event horizon. Or, as uh, David Finkelstein put it, who introduced these coordinates in 1958 and who uh, wrote down exactly this discussion, which uh, I just, um, I'm, I'm giving right now, uh, or he, he called it a one-way membrane for signals. So signals can cross it only in one direction. Yeah, signals can move from from outwards to inwards, but not from inwards to outwards. And uh, yeah, of course, what this construction does not tell is whether such objects really exist in nature. Yeah, if there are objects in nature whose physical radius is smaller than RS. So for the sun, just to remind ourselves, this would mean that we would have to compress the sun beyond a radius of three kilometers. Yeah? If such objects exist, such dense objects, of course, the mathematical construction doesn't tell us. And when Finkelstein uh, uh, discussed these, uh, these topics in, in 1958, I think most people believed that uh, they would not exist in nature. Yeah. But now we are fairly convinced that they do exist. Uh, so what exactly happens with a body when it, uh, when it uh, collapses beyond R equal RS? We will discuss in the next section. We will discuss uh, the collapse of a ball of dust in the next section. So at the moment we just observe, whenever this has happened, whenever this R equal RS is in the vacuum domain outside of the body, then we have a horizon. And well, why is it called black? Maybe I should have, uh, uh, and the space time is called, or let's say the region, the region between R and RS, I think that, that's a good terminology. This region is called a black hole. It's called a black hole. Why is it called black? Well, it is called black because uh, yeah, no signals, in particular, no, no light, light ray, can escape from inside this region to the outer region. Of course, it can be surrounded by matter, so we can hear uh, yeah, uh, matter which uh, radiates, and then, of course, we would, uh, could observe this matter. But we cannot observe anything which is inside the horizon. So from inside, there's no signal coming out. That's why it's called a black hole. We have, uh, from this picture, we can read another interesting property. Namely, this is what, what Penrose called uh, the existence of closed trapped surfaces. Let me remind you, here I have plotted R and a time coordinate. So theta and phi are not shown in this picture. Yeah? So we have, in your mind, you have, uh, the, you have to have the other two coordinates, theta and phi. So actually, each point in this diagram represents a whole sphere. Yeah, when I say this is an outgoing light ray, Actually, uh, I should say this is uh, not just one light ray. I can concentrate on one, but uh, actually there's one in each direction. For each direction, theta and phi, there's one light ray. So all of them together form a sphere which expands. Yeah? So here it has this radius. At a later time, it has this radius and so on. So the sphere expands. It's an outgoing sphere. And this, correspondingly, is an ingoing sphere where the radius shrinks as the radius becomes smaller. Remember, this R coordinate, Schwarzschild R coordinate, really has a meaning of measuring the area of spheres. Yeah? It's the area coordinate. So it's really the physically measured area uh, I'm talking about. And now let's look what happens inside. Inside, I also have two families of light-like directions in this uh, R CT prime bar diagram, but both go in the direction of decreasing R. 
So usually if you have a sphere, we are used to the, um, to the idea that uh, one side is the outer side and the other side is the inner side. And if I go in the outwards direction, then the sphere becomes bigger. And if I go to the inward direction, the sphere becomes smaller. But here we see for both families of light rays, this means for both spheres, the radius becomes smaller. Yeah? So if I send light rays outwards in quotation mark, then actually they converge also, yeah? just as the other ones which are pointing inwards. And that's what Penrose clo uh, called a closed trapped surface. And the existence of closed trapped surfaces can all also be, be viewed as an indication for a black hole. And there's another definition of the notion of a horizon, which says that the horizon is a boundary of the area in which closed trapped surfaces occur. This definition of a horizon is called the apparent horizon. Yeah? So it's a different notion from this event horizon. The event horizon tells uh, what an outside observer could see. Yeah, it distinguishes between events from which the observer could receive signals from events from, which, from where he could not receive signals. The apparent horizon is something which is defined more in a local way. It doesn't refer to, to an observer who is far away. And uh, let me write this down. So in the region, there are closed oh. surfaces. I've just explained what this is. The event horizon oops, uh, coincides with the boundary of this region. So that's true for the Schwarzschild space-time. It's not true for all space-times with the boundary of this region. And this boundary is called the apparent horizon. So there are two different definitions of a horizon. The so one is it refers to a distant observer and it distinguishes events from which signals can reach this observer from other events. And the other definition looks at closed trapped surfaces and says is the horizon is the boundary of this. And for the Schwarzschild space time, these two definitions coincide. They give the same horizon. It's the surface R equal RS. But in general, these two definitions do not coincide. And uh, well, a lot of work which is nowadays done in general relativity is numerical work because uh, things become so complicated that there are not many calculations you can really do by hand. And if you study black holes in terms of numerics, then it's very difficult to work with a distant observer. Yeah? So you want to do something yeah, in a, in a finite, on a finite grid and uh, you don't want to refer to something which is, which is very far outside. And the people who are working with black holes numerically, they always refer to this definition of an apparent horizon, because this can be handled numerically uh, much nicer than the notion of an event horizon. So if you see pictures where these numerics people produce, uh, yeah, uh, they produce visual impressions of black holes and they, and they show you where the horizon is in this particular space time, it was always constructed in this way, with the notion of an apparent horizon. Okay, so this was a Schwarzschild black hole. First ideas about a Schwarzschild black hole. And you see, in order to do this construction, in order to construct this Eddington Finkelstein diagram, we had to decide if we want to work with the ingoing or with the outgoing light rays. And we get a black hole. That's the thing I have discussed now, if we do it with the ingoing light rays. You can do the same thing with the outgoing light rays. You just change the sign here. You just change the sign here. Yeah, you do it here with the other sign. Then the log term drops out for the outgoing light rays, and you get it twice for the ingoing ones. And uh, then you get just the time reverse picture. Let me briefly discuss this. It's not of the same physical importance than the, uh, the outgoing, uh, than the ingoing, I think, Finkelstein. Uh, coordinates, but it's also, it's also um, uh, a valid mathematical construction. And we can speculate whether things which are constructed in this way really exist. They are then called Schwarzschild white holes. So, uh, yeah, use outgoing 
add in Finkelstein coordinates. So there we have the ingoing ones. And now I choose the other sign, so I just choose here a minus sign, right? Yes, I just choose here a minus sign. So I have, I call this now T double prime. This is now T minus, what was it? Rs times log, uh, Rs over C. R minus Rs minus one. And then I get, uh, for the ingoing light rays, something with a factor two, and for the outgoing light rays, straight lines. Let me just draw the picture. Oops. Here's R, and now here's C double prime. It is just a time reversed situation. Yeah? The mirror image where you change the time coordinate, uh, uh, where you reflect it. So now the outgoing ones are straight lines. Oops. And the ingoing ones are diverging at the horizon. And because the light rays, uh, the, the light cones are lying in this way, you see that now at the horizon the light cone is outward. Yeah. It touches the horizon, but uh, uh, with the exception of the tangent line, the light cone now is outward. And this means that uh, yeah, light uh, signals can now not enter from outside to inside. Yeah? They can only go from inside to outside. So that is what is called a Schwarzschild white hole. Oops. White hole. And at the moment, we think that white holes do not exist in nature. But a couple of years ago, we thought that black holes wouldn't exist in nature. And now we have changed our opinion dramatically. So maybe sometimes in the future, also these white holes will become, will become interesting. So they would have been, um, yeah. Uh, that would have been something if you have once, if you, if you start with your life inside this region and you have once, lo uh, once left it, then you could never return to inside. So it's not quite as dramatic as the other way around, right? If you, have, uh, if, uh, if you were born outside of the, of the horizon, then you have moved inside, then you can never come back. This would be more dramatic because then you would have been confined to this region and actually you would have to go to the singularity. Here, uh, well, if you have uh, if you have once escaped, you are you are uh, you are safe in the in the outside region. So this is much less dramatic than a than a black hole. Okay, you can ask yourself if maybe you can do both things simultaneously. Yeah. So we have learned now how to extend the, our original Schwarzschild space time, which was well behaved in the domain r bigger than r s. We have learned how to extend this to the region r smaller to r s in two different ways. We can do it either in the way that we get a black hole. This would mean that we, yeah, that we glue together, if you look at the original picture, that we, that we pull down these light rays with a coordinate transformation and then we glue them together. This was the first construction. So in a sense, we have, uh, we have glued the interior part uh, to the future of this region. And then we have this white hole construction. There we have pulled the light rays the, uh, up with a coordinate transformation and then glued the outgoing ones together. So in a sense, we have glued the interior part to the, par to the past of the exterior part. And now we can ask ourselves, can I do both things simultaneously? And actually, this can be done. The coordinate, coordinate transformation must then be in a different way. It must really mix the T and the R. So we, we, here we have only, we have still our old R and a new T. Then we need a new R and a new T. And this is what Kruskal did, and what goes under the name of Kruskal coordinates. And I will discuss these now. So Kruskal is uh, yeah, a construction where you do a white hole and a black hole simultaneously. Where you get a space-time which contains a white hole and a black hole. Uh, the, uh, yeah, uh, the origin of the name Edith Finkelstein coordinates. 
uh, I told you that Finkelstein uh, introduced these coordinates in 58 and used them for explaining what was going on at R equal RS. Actually, Eddington had used the same coordinates more than 30 years earlier. In 24, I think, he wrote a very short paper where he used these coordinates, but not for explaining the behavior of the Schwarzschild metric at R equal RS, but rather for a comparison of Einstein's theory with an alternative gravitational theory. Namely, the theory which was brought forward by the British mathematician Whitehead. And in this short paper, he, uh, he used these coordinates just for this uh, comparison. He didn't say anything about R equal RS in this paper, but as he also used these coordinates, it's of course fair to call the coordinates Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates. Eddington, just to remind you, was a, was a person who did this, uh, this uh, solar eclipse uh, expedition in 1919, where the general relativistic light deflection was, uh, was confirmed. It was a very famous British uh, yeah, mathematician, originally also an astronomer, who wrote one of the first textbooks on general relativity. Okay, now let's do the Kruskal coordinates. So you have an even funnier history. Actually, you find these coordinates in a paper where the author is Martin Kruskal. But the paper wasn't written by Kruskal. It was written by John Wheeler. Actually, it came out of a discussion between Wheeler and Kruskal. And then Wheeler wrote it up. He submitted the paper under the name of Kruskal. Of course, uh, he talked to Kruskal and he, he sent it to him and, uh, and uh, Kruskal agreed with it, with this. But it is said that uh, Kruskal saw the paper for the first time when he received it for proofreading from the, from the journal. And then, of course, we said, yeah, that's fine. And he mentioned, uh, he asked, uh, he asked uh, Wheeler, of course, if he want to be the, the co-author, but Wheeler, Wheeler rejected this. So, uh, that, uh, that uh, Kruskal was a, was a plasma physicist. He never again wrote on, on general relativity. He was a very well-known American plasma physicist. So uh, where are we now? This was C, I think. After C comes D. This is Kruskal coordinates. And actually, this, uh, this uh, discussion between Kruskal and Wheeler was before the Finkelstein paper. But the publication of the Kruskal paper was later. So, uh, yeah, in a sense, you could say that Kruskal was the first to really uh, understood what and uh, explained what was going on at R equal RS, but it was published after Finkelstein. So, what's the idea behind the Kruskal coordinates? The idea is to do the two things which we have done once for the ingoing and one for the outgoing, adding Finkelstein coordinates simultaneously. That is, we want to have coordinates where both the ingoing and the outgoing radial light rays are straight lines. And if you play a little bit around with the equations, then you find that you can do this in the following way. So in this case, we have to transform from our Schwarzschild coordinate to new coordinates where both these coordinates are mixed. So we get two new coordinates which depend both on T and on R. And I denote them U and V. And they are defined in the following way. The so U. And uh, of course, the, the strategy is the same as before. We do this on the domain, r bigger than rs, and then we ask how far can we extend these coordinates. So, the, so what I write down is the expression for u and v in the domain where our old coordinate r is bigger than rs. And then we write down the metric, and we ask how far can we extend this metric. Oh, I forgot something important. Oh, my goodness, I'm getting, getting old. Uh, there's one thing which I haven't demonstrated, actually, but I should demonstrate this. That's, that's important. Namely, that the Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates are regular. 
Yeah? I didn't write down the metric and adding finger sign coordinates. We should do this. So that we really see that there are no that there are no pathologies at, at R equal R S. Sorry, I forgot this. Let me jump back to, to the adding finger stein. That's really a very important thing, so I think I shouldn't omit this. Oops. So regularity of the metric, regularity of the metric in, let's do the ingoing ones, it just, uh, the difference is just the sign if you do the ingoing on the outgoing ones, ingoing adding the Finkelstein coordinates. So what was the transformation? It was, this was the outgoing ones, the ingoing ones were with a plus sign. So I had T prime is T plus Rs over C and then R minus Rs minus one. And this gives me the differentials of course. DT prime is DT plus Rs over C. If I differentiate the log, I get one over. So I get one over R divided by Rs minus 1. And if I differentiate this here, I get dr over Rs. And the Rs drops out. OK, so that's the transformation for the differentials. And now I write down my Schwarzschild metric. The Schwarzschild metric is minus 1 minus Rs over R c squared dt squared plus dr squared over 1 minus Rs over R. And then comes the angular part. Let me just abbreviate this in this way. Well, actually, you find it in many books in this way. I don't like this notation, <laughs> actually, because um, yeah, it's not a square of a one form, not a square of a covector field. Yeah? It's, uh, it's a metric. Yeah? It's, a, it's a second rank tensor, uh, purely spatial now, three dimensional, uh, two dimensional, actually, on the, on the unit sphere. But that's the usual abbreviation for uh, uh, d theta squared plus sine squared d phi squared. Yeah. So it's a sum of two such terms. But it's not the square of a covector field, which is a d of something. Yeah. So this is a, it's an abuse of notation, but it's very common. So let me stick to this. OK, and now I insert. What do I want to do? I want to replace the dt by the dt prime. So let's do this. So here's a dt. I insert the expression for uh, from here. So this is dt prime minus n minus dr over c r over rs minus 1, the whole thing squared. And the rest is unchanged. 1 minus Rs over R plus R squared, the omega squared. I think I can squeeze one more line here. So now I multiply this out. 1 minus Rs over R C squared. And I get DT prime squared. Now I get, if I multiply these two terms, let me remind you what the square means. The square means tensor product with itself. Now I have, I get two terms, dt prime tensor dr and dr tensor dt prime. And the symmetrized tensor product is usually understood if you just write the two differentials one after the other. So I just allow myself to write two dt prime dr over c, one mi uh, no, r minus rs minus one. Yeah, and what this means is, d, uh, what this means with the two, dt prime tensor dr plus dr tensor dt prime. It has a symmetrized tensor product. The tensor product is not symmetric. You have to be careful. So if you, if you, are, if you <laughs> really use a puristic notation, then you would, would write this out as two terms with a tensor product. But it's, of course, much shorter to write it in this way. So please allow me to do this. And here I have c squared r over rs minus 1 squared. So that was this bracket. And the other things I just copied.
R squared minus Rs over R plus R squared, the omega squared. Oops. Oops. Let's continue up here. So the first is nice, the first term. It's minus 1 minus Rs over R C squared dt prime squared. Then the mixed term, you get a mixed term. That's a new feature, which we didn't have in any of the other coordinates we have considered before. So I get plus 2 times, let me see, this is 1 minus Rs over R. And here I take an R over Rs out of the bracket. Here I have C squared, here I have 1 C. If I take R over Rs out of the bracket, then I get 1 minus Rs over R, and the two things cancel. Uh, times dt prime dr. And the last one, there the c squared cancels, and I get, uh, yeah, let me write it. Uh, it's minus, right? There's a minus sign in front of everything. 1 minus rs over r dr squared c squared r squared over rs squared 1 minus rs over r squared and here the square cancels with this and the other terms are r squared 1 minus rs over r plus r squared the omega squared okay now we are almost done we just have to collect the dr squared terms so this is fine, can't do anything with this. Here I can cancel one factor of C, so I get 2C Rs over R, dt prime <coughs> R. And now let's see, I think I can take a 1 minus Rs over R out of everything. And then I have a plus 1 here plus 1 here, and here I get a minus rs over r squared. Something has gone wrong with a c, so I think I forgot a c squared here. I get a c, forgot a c squared here. Oops, and then it goes away. The r squared. And here you see the binomial formula, right? This is 1 minus Rs over R times 1 plus Rs over R. So we can write this more nicely in this way. So this is just 1 plus Rs over R times dr squared. And now look, there is, well, at first sight you might say, hey, wait a minute, here I still have a zero at r equal rs, right? So if gtt is, or gt, gt prime, t prime is zero, isn't that bad? No, this is not bad because, as I show in a minute, the determinant is finite because of this cross term, yeah? If you have a diagonal matrix and one of the diagonal elements is zero, then of course the determinant is zero. But if you have an off-diagonal element, this may save the determinant to be non-zero, and that's the case here. So the determinant of G, uh, let me write it this way, yeah? The determinant of the matrix which is formed out of the G mu nu, so this is, what is this? This is determinant of minus 1 minus, oops, Rs over R C squared. Then I have the mixed term, I have it here, C R S over R and here. I have here a zero. Uh, sorry, not a zero, nonsense. I have one plus R S over R. And uh, I have zeros here. 
Yes, I have no mixed terms which involve the angles. And the angular terms, they are still written there. For in front of d theta squared, I have a 1. No, an r squared, sorry. And in front of d phi squared, I have r squared sine squared theta. OK? And now let's calculate this determinant. Of course, I get from these two terms an r to the 4 sine squared theta. And then I have to multiply this out. So I get a minus 1 minus rs squared over r squared. Yeah, these two terms multiplied with each other and the c squared. And then minus these two, minus c squared rs over r squared. And if I've done everything correctly, <laughs> then two terms should cancel. Indeed, they do. Minus times minus is plus, and here I have a minus. So I'm left with minus r to the 4 sine squared theta. I just get a 1 times c squared. And this is different from 0, except on the axis, of course. Uh, our spherical coordinates break down on the axis. That's the usual coordinate singularity uh, at uh, theta equals 0 and theta equal pi. But apart from this, the metric is regular everywhere. And of course, it breaks down at the, at the origin. Yeah? But there we have this true curvature singularity. But at r equal rs, everything is fine. Yeah? So the metric itself is finite. So all the coefficients remain finite. And because the determinant is non-zero, also the inverse exists. Yeah? Also, the inverse is nicely behaved. So the price we have to pay is that we had to introduce a cross term. Yeah? So the metric is no longer orthogonal. So the t prime lines are not orthogonal to the R lines. Yeah? There's a, measured with the metric, there's an angle between them. That's the price we have to pay. OK, so this was a proof. I had almost forgotten the proof that the adding Finkelstein coordinates are, in fact, regular. That they put the metric into a regular form. And now I can continue with Kruskal. OK, I have 12 minutes. Maybe I can say a few words about Kruskal in this time. And then tomorrow I will continue with, um, with the Pernlevé-Gülstrand and with the Lemaitre coordinates. This will lead us uh, towards the collapse. These coordinates are particularly useful for discussing collapsing objects. For the understanding of what a Schwarzschild black hole is, I think the ingoing eddington Finkelstein coordinates are the most useful ones. So if you have understood this, then you have a very good basis of what a Schwarzschild black hole is. So now comes the uh, guy. So this is D, right? So as I said already, that's a transformation from TR theta phi to UV theta phi. We never do anything with the angles. Yeah, we have spherical symmetry and, of course, uh, it would be stupid to tamper with the angles and to, yeah, to, to cover the, the spherical symmetry. So we transform just um, the r and the t. And we do this by the following transformation. We introduce u as root r over rs minus 1. So you see this only works for r bigger than rs, right? So we start on the domain where r is bigger than rs, introduce a new coordinate there, and then we try to extend them. That's the strategy. 
So this is e to the r over 2 rs, uh, hyperbolic cosine ct over 2 rs. And the v is the same thing with a hyperbolic sine. R to Rs sinh CT over two Rs. And if you plot this, if you see which uh, part of the UV plane is covered by our old coordinates, you will find that it is a wedge. It is a wedge under 45 degrees. I will not uh, do the calculations here on the board to demonstrate this. I just tell you. And if you don't believe it, you would have to check it by yourself. So what you get is that your, your old region, R bigger than Rs, with which you start, is inside this wedge in the diagram. And this corresponds here to R equal plus infinity. Uh, where am I? Oops. Nonsense. This is, of course, R equal Rs but uh, t equal plus infinity is. Yes. And this here is r equal rs and t equal minus infinity. So you see that in these coordinates you can extend your, uh, your, your metric uh, beyond t equal infinity in this direction. That's similar to what we did with the ingoing Eddington-Fingelstein coordinates. Yeah, we pulled t equal infinity down to a finite value, and then we extended the metric. And if you go beyond this line, this would be similar to the outgoing Eddington Fingerstein coordinates. And actually, the light rays, the ingoing and outgoing light rays, are just straight lines under 45 degrees in this diagram. So these are the light rays. And now you get here, you get the singularity on a hyperbola. So this is r equals 0. And you also get the hyperbola here at r equals 0. And you get here, and now this is a new feature, the new and interesting feature. You get another copy of an outer region. So you get here the black hole. Yeah, the ingoing radial light rays move from the outer region to this inner region. So what you have above this line under 45 degrees that's what's covered by the ingoing Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. And what you have below this line under 45 degrees, it's what is covered by the outgoing Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. So here you have the white hole. And the new feature is you have a new copy of your outer space. Yeah, so here again you have r equal rs and t equal plus infinity. And here r equal rs and t equal minus infinity. But now you have another outer region. So if you extend it as far as you can, you get your old outer region, which borders towards the black hole and towards the bl uh, white hole. And you have another outer region. So if you call this here 1, did I call it 1 here? Yes. Then you have a region 1 prime, which is just a mirror image. It has the same properties. So here again, you have these ingoing and outgoing light rays. Yeah? It's, a, it's an identical copy. And the two things are glued together here. And that's a very interesting point, where the horizons come together. And uh, where also, that's the only point. It's a point in this UV diagram. So you have to imagine the theta and the phi coordinates. So it's actually a sphere. So at this point in the UV diagram, the two exterior regions, one and one prime, come together. And uh, actually, in the new worksheet, we will discuss the geometry of this surface. That's what, uh, what is called the so-called flum parab paraboloid. Yeah, so this surface, t equal constant, in the, say, in the equatorial plane. In the worksheet, we will do it for the equatorial plane, because I cannot draw pictures where all three spatial dimensions are represented in an embedding. Yeah? So we restrict to the equatorial plane. And the geometry of the surface t equal constants in the equatorial plane is something like that. It's a paraboloid. It's called the flum paraboloid. Here's a horizon. Yeah, here's a horizon. And this other region has a similar copy. And the two things are glued together at the horizon. So you get another copy of this flum paraboloid, which goes in this way. 
uh, the two things together, this here is what is called, so, so here is a region one, and here is a region one prime. And this is called the Einstein-Rosen bridge, because Einstein and Rosen discussed this in a paper in the 1930s. And this would be an example, as far as the topology is concerned, for a wormhole. So this topology, here's something asymptotically flat, here's something asymptotically flat, is what one calls a wormhole. That's the throat of the wormhole. But this is a non-traversable wormhole, so you cannot travel through it. You can read it from this picture, because if you want to travel from here to here, you have to move at superluminal velocity. Yeah? The light rays are under 45 degrees. So from each point, you can only move at subluminal speed inside this, uh, this, uh, this cone. So if you want to move from the region 1 to the region 1 prime, you would have to move at a superluminal speed. So it's a non-traversable wormhole. You cannot move from here to here. There are other ones, and these are the ones which played a role in this movie in the Stella. There are other wormholes where you actually can travel through. And Kip Thorne, the advisor of this movie, he was, he was one of the persons who invented these traversable wormholes. So together with a, with a person called Morris, he wrote the fundamental paper on these, uh, on these traversable wormholes. They are called Morris Thorne wormholes. This is an example for another wormhole, for a different type of wormhole, which is not traversable. So it's, you, cannot, uh, you cannot use it for time travel. Oh, on this occasion, I always forgot to, uh, to announce here in this, in this, or to this audience that we have at the moment here in Bremen a series of conferences in the Haus der Wissenschaft. Yeah, it's already running since a couple of weeks. It's to celebrate 100 years of general relativity. There have been three talks already. The next talk will be next Monday, and it will be about wormholes. It will be done by our colleague Saskia Gruner from Oldenburg. And if you are interested in this, then you should take a note of this date. So it will Monday on uh, 7.30 uh, in the evening in Haus der Wissenschaft. And there will be a whole series. There will be uh, several more, more talks on this. Uh, yesterday, there was a talk on black holes. I forgot to mention this here. It was an excellent talk by, by Jutta Kunz from Oldenburg. And uh, it was really stupid of me not to, not to announce this, this in time. But if you are interested in wormholes, you have a chance to listen to this talk next week. So this is the Kruskal situation. So again, it's a mathematical construction. And actually, this is a, the maximal analytic extension you can do. Yeah? So you can check that uh, you cannot go beyond uh, r equals 0. I've already talked about this. And here you are really at infinity. Yeah? So the space time is not extendable in these directions. So this is a maximal extended uh, Schwarzschild space time. It has two outer regions a white hole and a black hole. And the question is, does anything like that exist in nature? We believe that the answer is not. So we believe that what is relevant is only the region above this line under 45 degrees. So that we have a collapsing star, the surface of the star would be something like that, it would be in this region, and only everything which is outside of this is uh, of physical relevance of this picture. But maybe we are wrong, maybe sometimes uh, we uh, come to the, to the conclusion that also these white holes and the Einstein-Rosen bridge has a physical relevance. So this was uh, the Kruskal in brief. So I don't do any calculations here on the board. If you want to, to do it by yourself, uh, it's not too difficult. But as I said, I think uh, the Kruskal construction is not, uh, not extremely, uh, from a physical point of view, not extremely interesting. Uh, there are similar constructions where you also get the maximal analytic extension uh, by other people who did it in a slightly different way. There was Kjerz uh, Sekeres, Hungarian Sek... Oh, that's a difficult name. Sekeres. And there was a Norwegian um, uh, Christian Frunstal. Frunstal did a nice construction where you embed this whole thing into a higher dimensional space. Yeah? So where you, where you get it like a, like, a mountain, uh, like a mountain landscape in a higher dimensional uh, space. This is, this is quite instructive, but uh, yeah, apart from this, it's essentially equivalent to what Kruskal did. And um, as far as the physics is concerned, the same applies to this, that it's probably just a mathematical, mathematical construction. Okay, time is out, so this was my very brief uh, 
very brief overview of a cross skull. And then next time we will do in a little bit more detail, we will do the Pern Levy Gülstrand. They are again more interesting from a physical point of view. So we meet tomorrow at two o'clock here in this room if you, if you want to do so. And uh, so see you next time. <laughs>